All right, you guys. So can anyone here tell me, and, and by the way, can you guys, are you guys all muted? You can feel free to unmute yourself uh, during this, this presentation. You can also, let me pull up the chat box so that I can see that. Um, and uh, let's see here, chat. Okay, so now I can see the chat box. So you guys can feel free to, you know, fire off answers or comments or whatever in the chat box. You can also unmute yourself. Doesn't matter to me one way or the other. So can anyone tell me uh, where the word doctor comes from? It's somewhat of a rhetorical question. I think uh, I looked up doctor, one time. I think I'm this, sorry. This is Max. Um, I think hey, I looked this up one time. This is uh, from like doesn't mean teacher. That's right. Yeah. Doctor derives from the Latin term docere, which means to teach. And this session is about teaching. And it will borrow from concepts featured in my uh, textbook, Frameworks for Internal Medicine. So let's begin by asking the question, who teaches medical students? And in the first two years, uh, medical students are taught predominantly by the basic scientists in the lecture hall. And in the second two years, they're predominantly taught by uh, clinicians in the hospital and clinic environments. What's interesting, um, or, or odd may be a better word, what's odd is that despite being responsible for the vast majority of medical student education, neither the basic scientists nor the clinicians receive any formal training on how to teach. And I've always found that to be strange. And I think it's great that the program has carved out this time for you guys to kind of focus on developing this skill. It's difficult to teach as a resident. There are a lot of competing responsibilities. You're trying to balance your own needs as learners and trainees with the needs of the students on your teams. And that can be a very difficult balance to strike. I, I definitely understand that. But now is the time for you to start teaching. Some of you may question whether you're qualified to teach. And the answer to that is yes, you absolutely are. And for the students, your teaching is, is very much welcomed. You know, in the old days before our time, um, back when academic centers were smaller and students were fewer in number, they would spend a lot of their time with the attendings, learning directly from the attending physicians. And over the past couple of decades, with the growth of academic centers, attending physicians are now, you know, spending more of their time doing non-teaching activities, and that has left a teaching void. And who better to fill that void than the individuals who are in the trend with the medical students? And that's you guys. And when you start teaching, we'll do two things for you only. Number one, it will uh, improve your confidence. You know, when you teach, you assume a leadership role and students respect that and you, and you can feel that and get that feedback and it feels good. Secondly, as we all know, when you teach something, you it forces you to understand it at a more sophisticated and kind of uh, fundamental level. And so actually teach great for your own learning. So what should you teach? Well, that's the thing that you can teach, but in my opinion, I think that students, especially students, I think students, residents, and even um, you know, practicing clinicians should be spending a lot of their time focused on diagnostic skills, diagnostic reasoning, um, especially students. You know, once the diagnosis has been made, um, treatment and management are things that can always be looked up. You know, once you've made the diagnosis of acute pericarditis, you can always look up, okay, what's the NSAID, what, the, what is the dose, is it colchicine, et cetera, and so forth. But the process of making a diagnosis is not so simple. And in order to diagnose, a clinician has to do three things. One, they have to know what information is important to acquire from a case. You know, you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're asking a head-to-toe review of systems, hoping to stumble upon a clue, or you're doing a head-to-toe physical exam, or you're doing a shotgun approach to a laboratory investigation, hoping to stumble upon something. You want to you want to know what information is important to acquire from from each case. It's not enough to know what information is important to acquire. You have to have the skills to acquire that information, then finally synthesize it. But we're going to focus on that first step, which is understanding what information is important to acquire from from a case. And I think that's where students we should spend a lot of our time, kind of educating students on this first step. And what is my strategy for understanding or knowing what what things I need to extract from a case? Well, one of my strategies is to uh, develop a differential diagnosis. Um, I try to identify a problem in a patient's case, whether it's a symptom, a physical finding, or a laboratory abnormality. And I try to generate a differential diagnosis around that problem. And the earlier you do this, the better. Why? Because now your history and physical and laboratory testing are all hypothesis driven. 
you know, um, it will, uh, your, your differential diagnosis will tell you what, what information is important to acquire in a particular case. You know, if you are developing a differential around dyspnea and pulmonary embolism shows up in the differential diagnosis, that informs you that, that, that tells you, okay, I need to ask the patient certain questions to rule this in or rule it out. I have to ask them about, you know, injury to their leg. I have to ask them about previous clotting, personal clotting history or family history of, of blood clotting. I have to ask them about long plane flight. On physical exam, I should be looking for signs of a DVT. I should be listening, you know, and, and looking for signs of, of pulmonary hypertension, like a loud P2. So your differential allows you to um, kind of understand what information is important to acquire from a case. And I think it's, it would be, it's great to focus on this for students. So now that we've established that you are going to teach and kind of the, what you're going to teach in terms of differential diagnosis and diagnostic reasoning, the question is, how are you going to teach? And there are lots of ways to teach on the ward. What are some of the methods, teaching methods that you guys have seen on the wards or have employed yourselves? Chalk talk, good. I use a lot of uh, just Socratic method, just asking questions in the moment and um, trying to create an environment where like, I don't know is like a reasonable answer and it's like an opportunity for growth. So I just like throw out a bunch of questions to try to lead like a learner towards a direction. Yeah, no, that's great, Eric. Um, yeah, and, and uh, you guys are, are naming a bunch of the different ways you can teach on the ward. When I, when I was a student, um, it was not uncommon for fellows and for attendings to pull up PowerPoint on the computers in the team room. And I don't know if people still do that, but to me, PowerPoint definitely has a role in medical education, but I think it's best uh, utilized in the first two years in the, in the lecture hall setting, you know, where you have a defined amount of time for teaching you have a defined subject matter to teach and you have a defined audience for which that subject matter is intended. On the medical ward, all of those things are so dynamic. Um, you know, the time for teaching is never predictable. The um, subject matter is, is always variable. I mean, one week you could see a bunch of rheumatologic stuff on the ward, the next week it's a bunch of ID stuff. And then finally, your audience is variable as well. Um, you know, sometimes it's med students, PA students, pharmacy students, sometimes a mix of all of the above. So you need a teaching method that is a lot more flexible than the sort of cookie cutter PowerPoint presentation. And in my experience, as you guys have already mentioned, some of you, I think using the whiteboard to teach is the single best method for teaching on the ward. And using sort of uh, illustrating concepts um, is uh, to, to convey a message is something that is uh, sort of deeply ingrained in, in human uh, history. You guys might be wondering what the hell is this picture that I have up here? Well, this is a this is a cave painting from the uh, Paleolithic period, from 15,000 BC in uh, in Spain, and it's a a drawing, uh, a cave painting of a mammoth with its heart uh, drawn in the center there, and um, you know this is regarded as the world's first anatomic drawing. And certainly there was an audience that was intended to benefit from this drawing. In 1801, a teacher in Scotland used a giant piece of slate to illustrate concepts to a, to his group, to a group of students. And on the medical ward, this idea, this, this technique is known as a chalk talk. And over the years, I have found that uh, there are seven things or tenets that, that really improve the quality of a chalk talk. So first of all, um, they've done studies that have shown that audience sort of engagement and interest starts to wane after about 15, 20 minutes. So it makes good sense to sort of confine your talk within that period of time. And I know some of you are thinking right now, well, that's not gonna be a problem at all because there's no way I can stand in front of a blank whiteboard and talk for more than 15, 20 minutes anyway. And that's that's a valid point. And that's probably why people use PowerPoint because with PowerPoint, you know, the slides, you can talk for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, the slides cue the discussion point. So it's very easy to talk for any length of time, as long as you had slides available to you. Um, it's a lot more daunting when you're standing in front of a blank whiteboard. And I understand that concern. I think that's why a lot of people don't use the whiteboard, but the, the sort of the, the answer to that concern 
is the is the framework system having a framework so what is a framework framework is uh basically an organized approach to a topic and the non-medical example i like to give is imagine if i asked you to name all of the uh, states in the united states of america randomly as quickly as you could well you know you'd get going uh, for a while and then eventually you become disorganized and sort of come to a stop instead of you know uh, doing it randomly if you had a method behind it if you said okay i'm going to start with i'm going to do it alphabetically i'm going to start with the states that start with letter a then b then c and so on um, or you did it geographically and said okay i'm going to start in the northwest then go to the southwest northeast southeast you'd be a lot better off and the same is true in medicine. We're asked as internal medicine doctors to remember long differential diagnoses for so many different problems. I mean, there's 50 things that can cause chest pain, 50 things that cause anemia, 50 things that cause dyspnea. And if you just have a list, sort of a linear list in your mind, like, like we have here for systemic vasculitis, it's very difficult to wrap your mind around this. Instead of doing it this way, I would suggest organizing it into a framework. And so the framework for systemic vasculitis separates etiologies by the size of blood vessel involved. So large vessel, medium vessel, small vessel. This is just much better, uh, a much better way to approach a problem like vasculitis in terms of the differential diagnosis. Um, it's great for memory and recall. They did studies back in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, I, I sort of spent some time in the memory and learning literature and discovered that, um, you know, they did these studies where they would give uh, one group a l random list of words or, or a list of randomly sort of compiled and asked them to memorize that that list they gave the same uh you know words to a different group but organized those words in some way they were tethered together and um i don't think it would be surprising to anyone that the that the group that had the benefit of an organized sort of list of words were uh much better at recalling that list of words um so it's great for memory and recall the other thing is is that a framework can suggest a diagnostic workup so if we take our framework for systemic vasculitis again and we look at the small vessel arm well that subdivides into anca positive and anca negative uh, causes so if you have this framework for systemic vasculitis in your mind and you're you're approaching a patient and you and sort of thinking about small vessel vasculitis you automatically you know have a serologic study in mind that you would order uh, in terms of diagnostics same is true for the framework for pleural effusion which divides into transidates and exudates if you have this framework in your mind and you're approaching a patient who has a pleural effusion, it automatically suggests to you, I need to sample this, you know, uh, effusion and perform a thoracentesis to do so. And then I have to send that fluid for LDH and protein to calculate lights criteria to understand, am I in the transdate category or the exudate category? Same thing with the hyponatremia framework. So here, if we look at the hypotonic arm separated by volume status, hypovolemic, euvolemic, hypervolemic, this automatically suggests to you, not a, not a laboratory test in this case, but a physical finding that you want to pay close attention to uh, when you're seeing a patient with hyponatremia. The other thing about the, uh, having a framework is this is, will allow you to talk in front of a whiteboard for 15 minutes or more. Um, and uh, it, wouldn't, it will, in fact, allow you to achieve all seven tenets of the chalk talk um, system. And, and it'll probably be easier to understand how or why that is if we, if we go through an example. So, um, and normally when I give this talk, I, it would be in person and I'd be in front of a whiteboard and, and we'd actually go through, do a, do a chalk talk. Uh, but you'll have to bear with me. We'll have to pretend like that's the situation. Um, obviously we're limited uh, uh, in the virtual world that we're in now. Uh, but imagine that I'm standing in front of a, a whiteboard and we're on the, we're, you guys are the med medical students on the team and uh, and we have a patient coming into our team with uh, shortness of breath. She's a 54 year old woman. She has a history of Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with mantle field radiation. And she comes in with dyspnea. She describes an enlarging abdomen and bilateral lower extremity swelling. She's gained 20 pounds since, the, since these symptoms began. The patient is an avid uh, cyclist, but has been forced to give it up in recent weeks because she can no longer keep up. The lymphoma has been in remission since treatment without evidence of recurrence. Social history is notable for consumption of one to two glasses of wine with dinner on a nightly basis. There is symmetric distension of the abdomen, abdomen with bulging flanks and the presence of shifting dullness to percussion. What is the most likely cause of studies in this patient? This is actually a case from the book, but we're going to pretend as if we're on the ward because this would not be an uncommon case. And this patient comes in and you decide that you want to do well. And it's me in this case. I'm the resident. You guys are students. I want I decide that I want to talk to you guys. I want to do some teaching and I want to do a chalk talk. And so I'm going to I'm going to talk to you guys about ascites. That is a great choice because it is relevant. 
you want to talk to students about things, problems that they're seeing on a day to day basis on the ward, uh, common things, you know, anemia, chest pain, dyspnea. Um, and if you can pick something that one of the patients on the team has, it's even better because there's immediate applicability for the students and they're going to pay much more uh, attention to your talk than they would otherwise. I remember once a resident giving a talk on uh, research that she was involved in and she was looking at, uh, you know, basically the performance characteristics of plastic versus metal stents in patients with cholangiocarcinoma. A very, a, an important research topic and important population of patients, but not something that you want to talk about with students who are on their general medicine rotation. Again, you want to talk to them about things they're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis in medicine that are commonly seen. So you, you choose, well, I choose ascites. I want to talk to you guys about ascites, and it's a great choice because it's relevant to one of the patients that we have now on our service. So imagine this is the whiteboard. So I've written ascites on the board here, and I, now I'm going to ask you guys, what, first of all, who can tell me what ascites is? Fluid in your abdomen. Yes, exactly. And what are the symptoms of ascites? That the abdominal fullness, distension. Yep. Shortness of breath. Exactly. What are the physical findings of ascites? Fluid wave, shifting dullness. Perfect. Bulging flanks. Exactly. Exactly. And what are the two um, kind of mechanisms of acidic fluid formation. Portal hypertension, non-portal hypertension, exactly. And how do you how do you know whether you're dealing with ascites that was generated by portal hypertension or not? The SAG, exactly. So what is the SAG? Yep, it compares the uh, albumin concentration in the serum with albumin or with the acidic albumin concentration, serum, ascites, albumin gradient. So you take the albumin concentration of serum and you subtract from it the albumin concentration of the acidic fluid, and out comes this number. And, you know, if you have this number memorized, greater than 1.1 is associated with portal hypertension, less than 1.1 is associated with non-portal hypertension. That's great, but it's but it's one of those things in medicine where if you don't have it memorized, that's also okay. You can reason your way through this. So uh, what are the two uh, forces that govern movement of fluid uh, from the, the vascular space to the third space? What are those two forces? Hydrostatic and oncotic, exactly. And what's the major oncotic player in blood? Albumin, which is represented in this equation. So if you have a high gradient, that suggests that you have a, a healthy amount of oncotic force within your blood that's holding fluid in, and you don't have very much oncotic force within the peritoneum pulling fluid in. So what force, if you have a high gradient, what force is, is um, pushing fluid into the peritoneal space? Hydrostatic, exactly. And that's why it's associated with that. That comes from portal hypertension. And then portal hypertension can be further thought of in terms of prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic. Um, on the other side, if you have a low sag or a low gradient, and you're no longer in this situation, now you're in a situation like this. So either you don't have very much oncotic force within the blood, and that's allowing fluid to leak out into the third space, like the peritoneal cavity, or you have an increase in oncotic force within the peritoneum pulling fluid in, um, causing ascites. Uh, so you can have protein poor uh, fluid in the, in, in the first instance or protein rich fluid in the second instance. And you know, what, what did you guys notice here? Uh, you generated all of the answers. You basically have generated all of the uh, talking points so far in, in this talk. And uh, that is, you know, the tenet of participation. You wanna get your audience to participate actively. Passive learning is, you know, difficult. Um, and uh, it's a lot harder to retain information than when you're actively engaged. So you wanna, you wanna actively engage your audience and, and, and get uh, audience participation to happen. The other thing that you'll notice that we've had a pretty rich discussion about, uh, first of all, what is, you know, what ascites is. We talked about the symptoms of it, the signs of it. We talked about SAG, starling forces. And you'll notice that none of that is written on the board. 
most of what transpires during a chalk talk should be spoken, not written. Okay, and that's the tenet of verbalization. If you if you try to write down everything that transpires during a chalk talk, two things will happen. Number one, you will spend so much time writing that you'll fail to satisfy the first tenet of timeliness. Second, if you if all you do is write on the board, your your back is going to be facing the audience for most of the talk, and you're going to lose that audience participation and engagement. So I think it's really important to uh, to understand that that most of what happens during a chalk talk should be spoken, not written. So here is the the full framework for uh, approaching ascites, and this, by the way, is why you can talk in front of a blank whiteboard. This this is your outline. It acts like your PowerPoint slides. All you need to know going into a talk on ascites is this outline, and you can fill in the rest. We can all ask questions about symptoms, signs, SAG, um, etc. And, you know, at this point in the talk is when I would, again, um, sort of engage with the audience. And so I'll ask you guys to name some etiologies uh, that belong in this framework. And so you can just, you know, name something and tell me where it belongs in the framework. Let's try to go for one sort of one item in each, in each category. Just for the interest of time. Cirrhosis under hepatic, portal hypertension and hepatic. Exactly. Yep. But Chiari, that would go under post-hepatic. Perfect. Heart failure, another post-hepatic cause. Excellent. What's the equivalent of Bud Chiari on the pre-hepatic side? So now it's not uh, yet portal vein thrombosis. Exactly. Perfect. How about how about protein poor, where you have low oncotic force of blood, allowing fluid to, to leak out into the peritoneum? Malnutrition, nephrotic syndrome. You guys are good. How about protein rich? You, you might send it for uh, TB is a great choice. I was going to say you might send it for cytology, but Julie beat me to the punch, uh, named off malignancy. Awesome. So that's exactly right. And so this is the interplay that that I have with students when I'm giving a chalk talk is I will allow them an opportunity to fill in things and then I'll start supplying hints. You know, you don't want to just start filling in the answers. You want to continue to engage them. So you'll give them hints. OK, you guys forgot about Bud Chiari. You know, let's say you did. You, you didn't in this case, but let's say you did. I would say, OK, you know, you have a young woman. She's on oral contraception. She's a smoker presenting with acute onset abdominal pain. And that would give them the, the clues that they need to identify Bud Chiari. And in a similar way, I'd go on to extract all of the answers from, from, the, uh, from the students. And so um, this is the, the, the approach to ascites. And, and also in terms of diagnostic reasoning, this gives you your differential diagnosis in a nice organized way. So now students can recognize what information they need to gather from patients. Hey, look, heart failures in my, you know, differential for ascites. Did I ask them about orthopnea? Did I ask them about PND? Did I ask them about weight gain? Did I look at their jugular venous pulse? Did I listen for that S3? Um, you know, so the, so this is a great way for students to begin to approach problems in internal medicine. I think that's where we should be focused on in terms of our teaching. Um, and by the way, the tenant of adaptability, what, what, what does that mean? Well, that means that, um, you know, Again, as entities show up on the framework, you know, you can ask your audience questions about those individual causes or etiologies. So, for example, if heart failure shows up on the differential, I might ask, if I'm talking to a group of students, I might ask them something that's on their level. I might say, hey, what are the physical findings of heart failure? You know, JVP, S3, et cetera. If I'm talking to a group of residents, that is something that you know they're they're pretty familiar with. So I might I might ask them a higher order question, maybe to tell me what are the physical findings of high output heart failure. That's a harder question. Or I might ask them about balloon pumps or you know LVADs, advanced heart failure therapies. That's something more directed at their level. And in this way, these these talks are totally adaptable and customizable. I can take the same framework, and I could deliver two totally different talks depending on who my audience is. And sometimes the audience is, is varied. So again, you might have students in the audience, you might have interns in the audience. And so you can ask specific questions of specific individuals. You're not tied to that cookie cutter kind of PowerPoint presentation. You can customize these talks and that's what makes them so great for word teaching. And that's the tenant of adaptability, as we mentioned. The last two tenants, reliability and completeness, uh, we didn't touch on. So in terms of reliability, what I mean there is that, um, you know, students should be kind of, 
building their foundations of medical knowledge on hard findings. So what's a hard finding? Well, we know that a SAG greater than 1.1 is associated with portal hypertension. They should be building that into their kind of their approach to ascites uh, as much as possible. Um, in terms of completeness, so, you know, uh, if, if you give one of these talks, uh, students will leave that talk with a, with a complete approach to a particular topic. And that is very valuable for them. So no matter how tangential the talk becomes, maybe you spend 15 minutes talking about cirrhosis when you're, when you're giving the, the, the talk on ascites, no matter how tangential you get, at the end, they'll still have that full framework and they'll walk away with that, which is really, really helpful for students. So let's come back to our case. We've got a little bit more information here. Um, so we, in addition to the ascites that we picked up on exam, we noticed tattoo markers on the anterior chest consistent with prior radiation therapy. See any palmar erythema or spider angiomas. The jugular venous pressure is uh, 16 centimeters of water is noted to increase with inspiration. What's that called? Two small sign, perfect. Uh, an extra heart sound after S2 is heard best with a diaphragm of the stethoscope over the apex and is recorded with a phonocardiograph machine. And that's the sound we're seeing here. So here's S1, S2, and then this extra sound. Anybody know? Uh, what this extra sound might be. Before you answer that, let's uh, let's get some more information from the case. So hematocrit is 32%, platelet count is 210, AST 67, ALT 78, T-Billy 2.3, INR 1.1. And you do a diagnostic paracentesis and the albumin concentration in the acidic fluid is 2.5 grams per deciliter, total protein of 4.3, and the serum albumin is 3.8. So if we're gonna approach this case, um, we wanna know you know, what What arm of the framework are we dealing with here? What is a SAG in this case? Well, uh, we know that serum albumin is 3.8 and the acidic albumin concentration is 2.5. So what's the SAG? It's 1.3, which is, you know, uh, greater than 1.1. It tells us that, the, that there's portal hypertension um, driving this, this picture. Um, and again, this is where students I think should be at. It should be really focused on this diagnostic process and developing these frameworks for approaching problems like ascites. Uh, so they, know, first of all, know what information is important to acquire. We have a lot of the information we talked about in terms of heart failure, in terms of cirrhosis. You're looking for things like, you know, physical findings of cirrhosis. You're asking them questions. If you if you are concerned about cirrhosis, what historical questions would you ask uh, patients? thinking about the causes of cirrhosis. Yeah, history of alcohol use, IV drug use, getting in hepatitis, perfect, yeah, exactly. And that's how it works in, in real life. That's how we uh, make diagnoses. We have to, number one, gather the information, the clues that we then put together to, to make a diagnosis. So this is how it works. And so what is the diagnosis in this case? Uh, let's go back. Um, so what is this extra sound? Does anybody know? Could be an S3, and some. In fact, it was an, originally described as an S3, but uh, you'll notice that it's a higher pitch sound. It's it's picked up best with a with a diaphragm of the stethoscope. Um, and yeah, so Max is right. So it's a pericardial knock. Um, and if you can kind of put that together with elevated JVP, uh, with Kussmaul sign, a pericardial knock, um, and uh, with her history of radiation therapy. Uh, we uh, can put it together uh, to make what diagnosis? Constrictive pericarditis, exactly. Yeah, nice. So um, again, we decided to talk about ascites because it was relevant to a patient we were seeing on the ward. It has immediate applicability for students. Uh, at the end of the talk, again, no matter how tangential we get talking about the, you know, these etiologies as they show up in the framework, we um, the, the student will be left with this with this approach to ascites, and that's that's. Um, really helpful to them. Let's, uh, let's move on to a second case. Um, here we have another patient coming into our team. And this is a 51-year-old gentleman with chronic hepatitis C infection. Uh, he has cirrhosis as a result, and he presents with a shortness of breath as well. He sees a hepatologist for management of hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, and esophageal varices, which have been stable for several years. Patient has a history of shortness of breath that typically resolves following large volume paracentesis, which he is occasionally required. However, over the past few months, uh, the patient has noticed progressive dyspnea despite control of the ascites. And you'll see that I've kind of concealed some information from the case, which we'll get uh, later on. 
Heart rate is 100 beats per minute, respiratory rate 24 breaths per minute. Hemoglobin oxygen saturation by pulse three is 85% on room air with a patient in the upright position. Arterial blood gas shows um, on room air shows the pH is 7.48. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 32 millimeters of mercury and partial pressure of oxygen is 56 millimeters of mercury. So let's talk about, so again, if this patient came in, we could, we could talk about dyspnea, we could talk about hypoxemia. I'm gonna go with hypoxemia. And so uh, again, imagine we're in front of a whiteboard here and I'm gonna ask you guys, what is hypoxemia? Hypoxemia um, is the physiologic state in which the partial pressure of oxygen is lower than 80 millimeters of mercury. And we all remember this oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve. Uh, so here we have the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood on the x-axis, and we have the percent saturation of hemoglobin on the y-axis. Obviously, as the partial pressure of oxygen in blood goes up, so does the percent saturation of hemoglobin, but it's not a linear relationship. It's an S-shaped curve. And the numbers that I commit to memory are 27, uh, which corresponds to, so 27 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood corresponds to 50% hemoglobin saturation, and 60 is, is the other number that I like to memorize because that that corresponds to 90%. So this just gives me a nice frame of reference for when I'm thinking about hypoxemia. So let's talk about the framework for hypoxemia. And, th and so I'll just give you the first branch point up front. So you, you have uh, causes that are associated with a normal AA gradient and causes that are associated with an elevated AA gradient. So that begs the question, what is the AA gradient? And if uh, I let you guys answer, you would have said that the AA gradient is the difference and partial pressure of oxygen between what the lungs are seeing, the big A and the alveoli and arterial blood, the little A. So it's a difference between oxygen here and here. So how do we know what oxygen the lungs are seeing, what, uh, how much oxygen the lungs are seeing, and how do we know how much oxygen is in arterial blood? Well, big A is calculated in the alveolar gas equation and little A is derived uh, by measuring it in arterial blood by getting an ABG. So let's talk about calculating the, a, a, the, the, the big A using the alveolar gas equation. I know it's sometimes tough to look at these equations, but this is one that I would commit to memory. It's one of the equations in medicine that can really help you understand physiology, uh, sort of like cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. It's just, it, it's very helpful for understanding. And so here's the alveolar gas equation. So big PaO2 is equal to the partial pressure or the fraction of inspired oxygen um, which is the uh, fraction of inspired oxygen on room air multiplied by uh, barometric pressure or atmospheric pressure minus water vapor pressure. And then that whole term, uh, you subtract from it, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide divided by the respiratory quotient. So what is the fraction of inspired oxygen of room air? You can tell me. 21%. What's barometric pressure or atmospheric pressure at sea level? 760 millimeters of mercury, perfect. What is water vapor pressure? That's 47. What's normal uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood? 40, perfect. And the respiratory quotient, generally at 0 0.8, somewhat depends on diet. So let's calculate your big AO2. What are, what are your lungs seeing right now? So we're gonna plug in uh, some numbers to this equation. So 21%, we're at sea level, 760 minus 47, our carbon dioxide levels are around 40 respiratory quotient of 0.8. Turns out our lungs are seeing a partial pressure of oxygen of around 100 millimeters of mercury. And remember, if, if you know, we probably, we have good diffusion, or at least uh, I would hope we do. So, you know, the, the oxygen that our lungs are seeing get, are getting is moving across and diffusing into the artery. And so our little AO2 is probably somewhere close to 100. And that's why we sat at 99 to 100%. Uh, little AO2, uh, our partial pressure of oxygen in our arterial blood is pretty close to 100. We're allowed a little bit of an AA gradient depending on age. So you're allowed up to 17 if you're 20 and up to 38 if you're 80. So let's focus on the arm of the framework in which there's a normal AA gradient, but patients are still hypoxemic. And that may seem a little paradoxical. You might be wondering, how could that, how is that possible? And it comes back to the idea that the, the little A is at the mercy of the big A. If your lungs aren't seeing very much oxygen, then your little a won't be able to either. It can't be better than what your lungs are seeing. And it comes back to the alveolar gas equation. So look at these terms. So what would drive P big AO2 down? Well, this would drive it down or this would drive it down. And so, you know, if you're, you know, at high altitude or you're, or the 
partial pressure of oxygen or the fraction of inspired oxygen is less than 21% or your, your uh, PAO, PACO2 is elevated, all of those things are gonna drive the big AO2 down. And so what are those things? Uh, we just talked about it, reduced um, partial pressure of inspired oxygen and hypoventilation. So let's, let's um, go through an example to help drive home this point because it still may not make sense to you guys. Why, how can a normal AA gradient, how could somebody be hypoxemic with a, with a normal gradient? Well, let's take an example of somebody with a PaCO2 of 80. So this person's hypoventilating. The same numbers are gonna be plugged in with the exception of 80 instead of 40. And what do you get? You get a P big AO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury. So even if you have perfect diffusion in that situation, the AA gradient is zero, perfect AA gradient, you are still hypoxemic. Your partial pressure of oxygen in blood is less than 80, which by definition is hypoxemic. And this person's gonna be satting in the mid eighties. Does that make sense? So uh, now I'll ask you guys to kind of fill in some of the, some of the causes of reduced inspired oxygen and hypoventilation. What are some, some etiologies there? Yep, opioids are, very common cause of hypoventilation. So toxins, opioids, benzos, sleep apnea, perfect. And then we also, we, we mentioned high altitude, um, maybe you're in polluted air or something like that. And so this is the differential for this part of the framework. So now let's shift over and talk about um, where you have an elevated AA gradient. So here, uh, what, your, what your lungs are seeing is different than what your artery is seeing. Um, and there's basically four mechanisms that can cause that. Um, one, in the first case, you might have uh, you know, a situation where aeration in the lung is good. So this is, this is gonna be VQ mismatch in the form of dead space. So V is good, but Q is poor. Something's blocking blood flow and that's gonna cause hypoxemia. You can also have VQ mismatch in the form of physiologic shunt where now your Q is great, but your V is very poor. There's something filling the alveolar space here that's not allowing oxygen to get in. Here, you have a situation where your V is great, your Q is great, but something there's the capillary membrane, the membrane here is thickened maybe with fibrosis or something that's not allowing the oxygen to, to diffuse across to the um, capillary. And then in the last situation, your V is great, your Q is great, there's, the, your membrane's fine, but here you have uh, the passage of deoxygenated blood directly bypassing the, the lung and going uh, into the arterial system causing um, hypoxemia. So what are some conditions that we can fill in uh, this, uh, this differential here, you guys? Well, maybe just name one, one or two in each category. So what's the classic cause of dead space where you don't have PE? Perfect. How about physiologic shunt? What are some things that can, yep, pneumonia, yeah, ARDS, um, which itself is not necessarily a diagnosis, but um, can be caused by infectious processes like pneumonia. Uh, what, can, what also can fill the lung here, the alveolar space? pulmonary edema, perfect blood, so DAH, exactly. How about impaired diffusion? What, what might cause ILD, perfect. How about anatomic shunt? Where do the two, where do shunts typically show up? What two systems? Yeah, intracardiac and what's the other? Intrapulmonary, perfect, exactly. So you guys are right on the money and here's our kind of full differential for thinking about hypoxemia. And when I'm giving this talk, you guys again have to imagine that we're in front of a whiteboard here and you're giving this talk to students and you're walking them through this framework. Again, all I need is this, this outline. And from this outline, I can talk about hypoxemia. I can talk about the definition of it. I can talk about the oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve. Um, you know, as entities show up in the differential, you ask some additional questions. So what, for example, uh, we, we already talked about pulmonary embolism, questions you might ask a patient with that, uh, if you're thinking about that condition. How about pneumonia? What, what historical questions would you ask a patient if you're concerned about pneumonia? Yeah, cough, fever, perfect. And on exam, you're looking for focal findings, um, you know, interstitial lung disease, uh, you know, you might ask them questions about whether they have connective tissue disease, uh, their, their smoking history, uh, exposures, work exposures, things like that. And that's how this works in real life. And I think this is where students should be. This is the level that students should be focused on um, is diagnostic reasoning. And what information do I need to extract from patients? And this gives them a great approach for uh, for for hypoxemia and when they have a patient with hypoxemia. So let's uh, 
let's go back to our case and what we have to figure out uh we're going to try to solve this case so what part of the of the framework are we dealing with here what's the aa gradient in this case so we have uh we have the two numbers we've got um first of all we have to we have to calculate the big ao2 and we have this paco2 of 32 so we're going to plug in the numbers and out comes a pa a p big ao2 of 110 millimeters of mercury little ao2 is 56 so the aa gradient is 54. So this gentleman, um, you know, at this age of 50, definitely has an elevated AA gradient. So we're dealing with this arm of the framework. And here we have more information. So before I disclose that information, let's, um, let's pick another couple of uh, entities here. And just in the interest of time, let's go, let's go to, this, this guy has cirrhosis. So what, what condition here um, kind of catches your eye and, and you think to yourself, gosh, I should, I should ask him certain questions or look for certain physical findings um, of this particular condition. Can anybody think of one in particular? And somebody with cirrhosis, what sort of jumps out at you? Hepatopulmonary syndrome, perfect. So what historical questions would you ask that patient? Maybe the nature of their symptoms. Positional shortness of breath. Exactly. That's called platypnea or orthodeoxia. In the case of symptoms, it's platypnea. Are you going to ask every patient you ever interview if they have platypnea? No. You're only asking this patient because you have a hypothesis. Remember, everything should be hypothesis driven. So you have that hypothesis. You're going to ask about that. How about on exam? Um, if you're thinking about hepatopulmonary syndrome, which can cause physiologic shunt or or uh, intrapulmonary shunt. What um, what physical findings are you are you looking for? We already mentioned orthodeoxia. How about in the hands? Perfect clubbing. Nice, Max. How about uh, what test might you order if you're concerned about um, hepatopulmonary syndrome? Bubble study. Perfect. And sure enough, we get some additional information. Um, so. Uh, let's see, there are multiple spider angiomas in the anterior chest, not surprising because he has cirrhosis. JVP is seven, lungs are clear to auscultation. So that allows us to kind of maybe move heart failure a little bit lower on the differential. That was on our differential uh, for hypoxemia, pulmonary edema. An image of the patient's hand is shown in figure 46.1. What is this? What does this show? Perfect. And are we going to look for clubbing in every patient? No, we had a hypothesis and we specifically looked for clubbing. You want to be the clinician that picks this clue up. And uh, when we're teaching students, we want to teach them how important they're so used to standardized tests where they get all the clues given to them, just like this case. They have this case. Everything's given to them in real life. They have to extract that information from the patient. They have to know clubbing is important to look for in this case. Not only do they have to know that clubbing is important to look for, they have to have the skills to acquire that information. And uh, so it's very important to really drill this home. And when you're giving these chalk talks to talk about the history and the physical exam, uh, that are hypothesis driven. So he, he, he has clubbing here. Arterial uh, blood gas, uh, we already know that information. Okay, so here's the TTE and it shows, what does it show? It shows, what is a bubble study? Somebody mentioned, well, you inject agitated saline into the right side of the heart and it creates these little micro bubbles and you can see them here on the right side. The left side should never have any bubbles because the right heart will pump the blood to the lungs. Those bubbles will dissipate in the lungs and uh, they won't show up on the left unless you have a shunt. And, uh, and so here's the same image eight cycles later, and here it shows the bubbles on the left side of the heart. And so uh, what does that mean? What's the diagnosis here? I think we already are on that path. We thought it was hepatopulmonary syndrome, and that's exactly, exactly what the diagnosis is here. So um, just in the last uh, couple of minutes, just to summarize. So first of all, teaching is great for you guys um, for the reasons we mentioned. It will improve your confidence immediately. It will, it's great for your own learning and it's great for your students. You wanna focus your teaching on diagnostic approaches to problems um, using frameworks and using the chalkboard to teach, use the whiteboard to teach. And remember the seven tenets of the chalk talk when you're, when you're delivering these talks. That's all I have for you guys. Um, here are my references. I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions. I know we got started a few minutes late. It's right at 10, 15, but if, uh, I'm happy to stick around for another couple minutes and, and sort of address questions.
Um, other than you and your book, any good resources you would direct us to on um, like imp- like clinical teaching, things that you found while learning how to be a teacher yourself? Um, yeah, I would say, well, first of all, I would just say experience. Just You just got to gotta do it. So force yourself to teach and force yourself to move out of your comfort zone. Start with, start with one or two topics that you feel comfortable with. Maybe it's AKI or maybe it's anemia. Um, I think we're all familiar with the framework for AKI, pre-renal, intra-renal, post-renal. Start teaching that on the wards and then it'll become like second nature to you. And once you've kind of mastered that topic, move on to another one and then you'll start to build your repertoire that way. Um, so I would just say, just start doing it. Whether you feel like you're good or not, just do it. Students will love it, trust me. And then as far as other resources go, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, there is an application called Human DX that I think is really good and will just help you kind of approach different cases that you might see on the ward. And you can kind of practice creating your own framework for uh, those problems as you know, as you get them in terms of, the, of that application, they'll, they'll present to you a case and ide- try to identify a problem in that case that you can create a framework around and start to practice that way. Um, and that way, when you do cases on the ward, um, you'll be able to do that kind of on the fly with your students. And, um, and yeah, I, I feel like, you know, again, just push yourself, um, say, okay, here's a patient with, um, with uh, arthritis. So I'm going to, I'm going to think about arthritis. I'm going to kind of think about that framework for arthritis and we're going to go talk about it on the whiteboard and remember that a lot of this stuff comes from your own knowledge base so all you need to know is the outline for that talk all you need to know is the outline for ascites and from that you'll be able to generate the questions and the talking points that you discuss with the students so we can all ask you know uh good questions about cirrhosis as it shows up in the differential we can all ask good important questions about heart failure when it shows up in the differential so you know, that's that's kind of the, the way that I uh, sort of developed um, these skills. And that's what I would uh, sort of recommend. Great, thanks. All right, you guys. Um, well, I think we're out of time anyway. So if you have questions, feel free to email me anytime. Um, you know, always available to uh, chat with you guys about anything. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to talk more about teaching, please reach out. You're you are most welcome. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Joe, are you back? Or Eddie, are you are you around? I think you guys must be muted. I'm gonna I'm gonna unshare and take off. See you guys later. Thanks again for having me.